This is section 9.2, part C, why confidence intervals give more information. The result of a significance test is basically a decision to reject the null hypothesis or to fail to reject the null hypothesis. In Trevor's smoking study, for instance, the data led us to reject the null hypothesis that P was 50% and conclude that the proportion of students at his school who would say that they have never smoked differs from the national value. We are left, though, wondering what the actual proportion P might be. A confidence interval might shed some light on this issue. So we're back to Trevor's example. He surveyed 150 students in his school, and he found that 90 of them have said that they have never smoked a cigarette. We checked the condition for performing the significance test earlier, so we know that all those conditions were met. Before we construct a confidence interval for the population proportion P, we should check that both the n times the probability of success and n times the probability of failure are at least 10. Since the number of successes in this sample is 90, the number of failures is 60, we can pro uh, proceed and go ahead and do the calculations. So our 90% confidence interval Remember back from chapter eight to find a confidence interval for a proportion, you're gonna do p hat plus or minus z star times the square root of p hat times one minus p hat all over n. In our case, our p hat value is 60%. Remember to find that z star value. If it is 95% confidence interval, that means 95% of the data is gonna fall within so if we find what part is outside, so that's gonna leave us with 5% or 2.5% in the left tail and 2.5% on the right tail. So this would have an area of 0 0.025. If we look up the area of 0 0.025 on table A, it's gonna give us a Z value of negative 1.96. So that means our Z star value is a positive 1.96. Now this is going to be a different standard deviation because we are using the p hat instead of that p value. So we are gonna do 60% um, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation of 60% is our probability of success and 40% is our probability of failure all over the sample size of 150. And that's going to give us an interval of 60% plus or minus 7.8%. Or if we subtract it, we're going to get 52.2%. And if we add it, we're going to get 67.8%. So we are 95% confident that the interval from 52.2% to 67.8% captures the true proportion of students at Trevor's High School who would say that they have never smoked a cigarette. The confidence interval in this example is much more informative than the significance test we performed earlier. The interval gives us the value of P that are consistent with the sample data. We would not be surprised if the true proportion of students at Trevor's High School who would say that they have never smoked a cigarette is as low as 62.2 or as high as 67.8. However, we would be surprised if the true proportion was 50% because this value is not contained in the confidence interval. The below figure gives computer output from Minitab software that includes both the results of the significance test and the confidence interval. So we're saying our sample p-value is 0 0.60, our confidence interval is given to us the z-value and the p-value. So based off of just the p-value, we can say that we, had, we did reject the null hypothesis, but from the interval, we can see why we rejected it, because that 50% does not fall in our in interval. There is a link between the confidence interval and two-sided test. The 95% confidence interval, so 0.522 to 0.678, gives an approximate range of the P sub zeros that would be, would not be rejected by a two-sided test at an alpha level of 0 0.05 significance level. With proportions, the link isn't perfect because the standard error used for the confidence interval is based on the sample proportion p hat, while the test statistic uh, 
is based on p sub zero. So these are going to give us slightly different numbers. They're not going to be exactly related because, again, this portion of it, we're using the p sub zeros from the null hypothesis. And for the confidence interval, you're using p hat instead. So there will be a difference when you're doing your calculations between the test, statistic, test statistic and the confidence interval. The big idea is still worth considering. A two-sided test at a significance level of, let's say, alpha equals 0 0.05 and a 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval. In this case, we did a 95% confidence interval. So if we have 100 times 1 minus 0 0.05, that's going to give us 100 times 0.95 or a 95% confidence interval um, would give us information about the population parameter. So what is the connection between confidence interval and two-sided tests? This is only true about two-sided tests. A value of p hat in one of the re rejection regions will result in a confidence interval that does not contain p sub zero. A value of p hat in the fail to reject h sub 0 region will lead to a confidence interval that includes p sub 0. So basically, in that last one, our p sub 0 was 50%. So if our confidence interval does not contain it, so the last one was like 5.22 to 0.678, since 0 0.50 is not in there, we can reject the null hypothesis. But if our null hypothesis is 50% and we go from like say 0.48 to 0.52, then that 50% is in that interval, so we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. The imperfect link we just described holds only for confidence intervals in a two-sided test. There is a connection between one-sided tests and confidence intervals but it is more complicated and not nearly as useful. So make sure you're only using this for a two-sided test. Let's check our understanding. The figure below shows Minitab output for a significance test and confidence interval for the restaurant workers data in the previous check your understanding question. Explain how the confidence interval is consistent with, but gives more information than the test. So on our test, we got a p-value of 0.106. Now our alpha level that we tested this with was 0 0.05, so we failed to reject the null hypothesis, which stated that our p, sub, our p value or p sub zero value was 75%. Now if we look at our interval, our interval says it's going from 0.588 to 0.771. As you can see, 0.75 does fall between those values, so it does make sense that we would fail to reject the null hypothesis because it is possible based on our interval that it would be 